Yep.
my way, God. My life is in your hands. I'm not worried about it. If you take me to the county jail for 20 days, I'll still do your will. If you cause me to to file bankruptcy, I'll still do your will. They can take my house. They can repo my car. I'm not worried about none of it because I've counted all loss for gain for you. Hallelujah. And when you understand, it's like, okay, so what can you do to me? What can you, devil, you have no power. You don't have the ability to destroy me. You should have did it before I got the name of Jesus at work in my life. But now that I know him, I'm not worried about you and your, and your, and your little schisms and isms. I'm already free. seen people take one step in and say it's too much. You haven't even had, you haven't even developed the history in it yet. And you stop. And the process is what it is for a reason. Somebody say it is what it is. It is what it is. It is what it is for a reason. God does nothing happenstance or on accident or just to say, you know, I really don't have nothing to do. Let me send Rita some challenges her way and kind of, you know, mess Antron up for a little bit. I, I'm just, I'm kind of bored, Peter. I just want to kind of stir up and ruffle the feathers. God isn't sitting back just, you know, looking down, sitting high and coming down low and saying, I just really want to see how I can really kind of push them close to the edge. Come on, take your time in the teaching. It's interesting. Because God knew just like Grandmaster Flash knew. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes you wonder how I keep from going under. So don't push me. Because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to. Ha, 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 ha. It's like a jungle. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? He know. See, he know. Grandmaster Flash just got to put it into some different words. But God knows. He knew it. Was, hey, listen. They was playing. In the throne room when, 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 when Satan came up there and was talking about Joe, it was already on repeat. <laughs> so, with seeing, God comes in and when he begins to order your steps, it isn't a drive-through order. This isn't like going through Hardee's or Wendy's or McDonald's. You go in and you say, I want a number two, and I want it large, and could you add some cheese to my curly fries? And all? It's not something that you can just kind of shotgun your way through. See, when you order it, see, God, he, you know, he's the author and finisher of our faith. You know, he's a master of culinary arts. The Bible says, taste and see that I'm good. And any meal that is worth eating that you can really appreciate being a connoisseur of good food, it takes time to prepare a good meal. And so if God says, listen, he said, I'm going to give you... He said, I'm, I'm going to give you this day your daily bread. Believe you me, it's going to be something that's able to fill you, something that's able to sustain you, something that's able to keep you. But some of us don't even allow the oven to get hot enough for the bread to rise. We out of the kitchen before there's even a chance for him to put in the oven and start preparing it for you. And see, you got to be able to stay still. Amen. The Bible says we got to stand still and know. The thing that you have to understand about knowing and, and, and knowledge is this, is that knowledge, uh, knowledge comes in three forms. And really, you have to be able to appreciate all three in order to get the fullness of what knowledge is. The first form that knowledge comes in is intellectual. There's nothing wrong with the book smart people and those who can quote all of the scriptures and know all of the iotas and can be able to you know grammatically correct it all and be able to exegete the text and do hermeneutics and homiletics. That's great. That's awesome. I'm glad for those because we need those. We need those who, who are read, who are informed, and all that good stuff. That plays its part and it serves its purpose. But then you have those who acquire knowledge experientially. And these are the ones who go through and have some experiences in their lives. And as a result of their experiences, they're now a more equipped and well-informed believer and or person. And that's great, too, because then you have people who said, you know what? I have a reference point. I've been through some things, and so I can talk to you about what I've been through. But at the same time, you need this other facet of knowledge to really kind of complete the deal. The third facet of it is that we learn knowledge observationally. Through observation, through watching, 
to observe you. This is why the Bible says watch and pray. See, what happens is we pray first and then we watch. And so then it's like, okay, if, but if I watch and I pray, then I can pray all the more effectively because now I'm observing, I'm seeing the movement, I'm seeing the changes, I'm seeing the tides grow. I'm able to really assess it and be all the more effective and impactful in my prayer. That's why the Bible says the effectual and fervent prayers of a righteous man avails much. Because in order for you to be declared righteous, you had to have taken some time with Jesus and be able to watch him and be able to experience his love and to be able to learn it intellectually as well. So you got to have all three in order to receive the fullness of it. So here we are. Here we are. So for those who are strong in observation, don't feel bad because we got something for you. For those who are strong in intellect, we got something for you. For those who are strong in experience, we got something for you because God is omniscient. He's all known. He said, I can speak to whoever I want, whenever I want. If, you, if, if you're that drama field saint, he can speak drama to you. Don't worry about it. He can, he can work that out. <laughs> so you don't have to be, you don't have to feel like you're left out. Like, this, church, this church ain't got enough drama. No, God will give you just enough drama that you need. <laughs> Anything else, you can people to take care of that, all right? <laughs> well, God has you. So that, that, was just, that was just a little precursor for you. If you have your Bibles with you, amen, I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 13 through 15. I'm going to read a couple versions of it. I'm going to read the message five, and I'm also going to read the Amplified Bible, Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. And I kind of want to lay some groundwork with this. See here, in the church of Galatia, it was, it was a church that had a wonderful mixture of believers who were a part of the Jewish faith that, con that, con that converted to Christianity, and then it was also comprised of those who were part of the Gentile faith or the heathens or those who, you know, worshiped the goddess Diana and, and, and all of these other things. And Paul was sent to the Gentiles, but at the same time, he was a Jew. So he was able, he was kind of like bilingual in that sense. He was able to really speak to both. And so here it is. God had used him to plant a church in Galatia. And the Jews that were there had a problem once they had gave their lives to Christ with the way that Paul was kind of what they felt like Paul was giving them a pass, the Gentiles. We're saying, listen, now we had to be circumcised on the eighth day and we have to observe all these laws and rituals and customs and these ceremonial things. And, and, and that's all fine and dandy, but here it is, these other people who just come in and they ain't circumcised and they ain't really kind of practicing how we practice it. And so we have a problem with it. And what happens is when somebody gets saved, they, they, it, it, you have to be careful, you have to be mindful because you will... If, if, People will come and try to impose their definition and their, 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 their perception of salvation upon you and say that if you're not walking like this, if you're not talking like this, if you're not attending Bible study, dance class, if you're not a part of the drama ministry, if you're not on the praise team, if you're not passing out chicken dinners on Sunday night or whatever, then really you don't have the firmness of what it is. And then you have those who just come kind of brands fluffed out of the fire, they sag and do rags and fitted caps on, coming in like, you know, it's whatever with me. I'm here for Jesus. You can get it. Uh, they have a problem with that. And so the church of Galatia had a problem with that because they, didn't, they said, how can we be one but yet different? When you think about this, how can you be one but yet different at the same time? So we start talking about, let's, let us read together. The Bible reads, it is absolutely clear that God has called you to be free, to, to, to a free life, I'm sorry. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Let's read that again. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want to do and destroy your freedom. Continue on, church. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Hold on. It says so. Give freedom an assignment. But at the same time, appreciate that freedom has a purpose. That's good. Think about that. Yeah. Because oftentimes when we get free, we think, man, I'm free. I can do whatever. You know, man, party all the time. We got prints on repeat. And he said, no. There's a purpose in this. And he said, rather use your freedom to serve one another. Not just to serve, but to serve one another in love. love. 
Amen. That's key. Don't read over that too fast. Because I know some of y'all hear the word love me. You don't love me. You don't care about me. If you love me, love would have brought you home last night. <laughs> this ain't that kind of party. <laughs> so just, just back up for a little bit. So let's continue on. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedom be then? Mm. That's the message. Bible. Amen. Now we have some intellectual saints that don't necessarily agree with the transliteration of the message Bible, so we're going to give a more appropriate reading of it. So I can get to come down they have to too, right? In the amplified version, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> For you, brethren, were indeed called to freedom. Only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity or excuse for selfishness. But through love, you should serve one another. For the whole law concerning human relationships is compiled within the one precept. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. But if you bite and devour one another in partisan strife, be careful that you and your whole fellowship are not consumed by one another. Paul was having this conversation with them. Because people were telling them, no, you have to go and get circumcised. He was telling grown, they were telling grown men that you gotta go, and if you really down for Jesus, you gotta go ahead and let me cut you. And, and it was a problem because now there was confusion. And we know that the Lord is in the author of confusion before wherever there's confusion, we know the enemy is not far. And so there was confusion in the body. And Paul had wrote him and said, you know, I'm disturbed by the fact that you're unsettled by this, this, this kind of, you know, foolishness that they got going on. But he said, listen, this the liberty I have given that God has given you, do not be enslaved again to the bondages where Christ has made you free. And so when you start understanding freedom, T.E. Lawrence said this, it's one of my favorite sayings. It says, freedom is not the absence of chains, but the choice of which ones you'll wear. Yes, right. Freedom is not the absence of chains, but the choice of which one you will wear. And so when you think about it, here, here it was, Paul was free, but we find him in the New Testament in one of the epistles saying, I'm a prisoner for Christ. Amen. So why would he call himself a prisoner to a, to a God, to a Savior that was there to set him free? Because you got to understand and know who and what you're hitching your wagon to. You can act like you ain't got your wagon hitching nothing, but something is leading and guiding you, whether it's in paths of righteousness or paths of foolishness. But Paul said this, that I am a prisoner of Christ. And so when you understand that there's some different chains that we are to wear, not in the sense of bondage, but not, not in the sense of enslavement, but to remind you to keep it on the forefront of your mind that you know what me and Christ have a covenant here we have an understanding we made an agreement he paid a price for me he redeemed me I couldn't be able to pay the price for the sins that I was going to commit and that I did commit but he canceled the assignment and he set me free and then he gave you truth because what happens is when you get set free truth of who you really are starts to emerge. This is why we are so critical and analytical of those who get saved in treatment centers and those who get saved in prisons. We call it jailhouse religion. It's an addictive theology. And it's saying the real test will be when you get free. But if you get free on the inside, no matter where you are environmentally or geographically, freedom is going to be the order of the day for you. And freedom is a decision. You have to be intentional about living a free life. And so he said, now listen, I don't want you to use your freedom as an occasion to sin, to get out and wild out and party and ball out and do all this other stuff. I don't want you to use your freedom as a means to say, okay, I got free. I'm not on drugs no more. I'm not robbing. I'm not stealing. I'm not hustling. I'm not do, doing living a promiscuous lifestyle. I'm not doing all these things. So now let me go and create a measuring stick of righteousness for those who are and follow them and beat them all the way to the church. 
that how we are sometimes. We'll get free, and now all of a sudden, everybody else, we now we become, you know, the, 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 the cattle hand. Now we all of a sudden prodding and poking and beating people and telling them how it is they should live their life and how it is they should conduct themselves. And this ain't what you do. And pull that down, sister, and pull them up, brother, and all this whole time. And God said, listen, he said, I've given you freedom for you to use it as an opportunity to serve one another in love. This is why there's so much drama in the church, because you got a bunch of free people without purpose. You have a bunch of free people without the assignment. And, it's, and it, when you understand, when you have those who are babes in Christ, or even those who are full grown in stature, but still infants in the word, and they're running around like the church is recess and it's one big playground, and it makes no sense, of course there's going to be drama. Of course there's going to be chaos. Of course there's going to be strife, because you haven't given them an assignment. And so as a pastor, you have to know those who God has committed to your trust, and be able to give an assignment that they're able to fulfill that is conducive with their personality, that that lines up with their strengths and their gifts and not because of their potential but where you know God has called them to be and then you have to cultivate it you have to build it you have to be patient it takes time because sometimes they fall sometimes they stand sometimes they run sometimes they sit but you have to continually see them how God sees them Amen. Thank you. Good teaching. so it's a good job it's also a job that comes with a lot of challenges. Because the assignment for freedom for my brother and her isn't the same assignment for freedom for my sister Kathy. But at the same time, you have to be a, a, a pastor is much like an orchestra conductor. You have to know how to give those their cue and their signals. While everybody else is still going on in theirs and playing their part. When it's time for the cello, you have to be able to make the eye contact without acknowledge the one who is on the cello and begin to release them to do theirs while at the same time you're allowing the trombone to be able to do what they're called to do. And then you have to manage it so much so because sometimes you can have a preference. The trombone may be your, your, your choice instrument, maybe the thing that draws you. You really don't, you really don't hear the cello, but you have to be able to be objective enough to allow yourself to step back and now bring those up so that now we can create the harmony and the synergy that God has called us to create because we are stronger together than we are apart. Yes. And don't worry about those who get solos. That's the problem. We become so preoccupied with those who get solos rather than being preoccupied with getting his favor, getting his love. We're getting his acceptance. We're doing his will. So what if you get a solo? Praise God. Amen. I'm glad you got a solo. But just as long as I'm in the number, I'm okay. Amen. Whether I'm in the front or the back of the line, I'm on the list. Amen. And sooner or later, I'm going I'm to I'm bust up in this thing. So I'm not worried about it. And if I see you getting in before me, it's like, oh, girl, do your thing. You be there. I'll be there in a minute. Save me one. <laughs> right? You know, you, you sit back happy. Just, you know, pump. Can't wait to get it. Like, yeah, look, I can't wait. <laughs> you got to be able to rejoice with those who rejoice because if you get in, that lets me know that God is still in the blessing business. He ain't closing the door. He's not playing favoritism. That's one from above me. I know if she made it in, I know for sure I'm going to get in not that she's worse than I am, but I know God, you still open the door for me. Amen. Amen. That's right. Jesus. So then you start serving. Because if God said that it's his turn to get in, the thing about being a leader is this. The leader has to be able to run up on the roof and see where the parade is going, but then come down and know how to lead. But the thing about being a leader and serving one another, and when I say leader, I'm not talking about myself because we're all leaders in our own right, in our own way. God has given us all the gift of influence. We're able to lead somebody, whether it's a child, our children, a co-worker, family, friends, whatever, somebody that we're seeing as a sick and shut in. God has commissioned or committed to our trust a certain number of people that we're going to lead. It is what it is. And whether you're an introvert, if you're a quiet person that's reserved and not really out and boisterous or whatever, but you have your own way of leading people in love and just random acts of kindness, you're still a leader. If you're an extrovert and outspoken and one of those more kind of, you know, seen persons, that's cool. You're still a leader. So what happens is that when it's time to lead, Renata, come up here. Antron, come up here. Raymond, come up here. Nick, come up here. I'm going to show y'all something. 
I want you to stand right here in front of me. Face the camera. Back up just a little bit. Nick, you stand in front of him. Bring him right here. Hands right here. This is the thing about freedom. And what I'm talking about freedom because everybody here has been set free. And we're here to serve one another in love. So check this out. I know I'm the leader. So I don't need to come and be on my face like I'm the leader. Y'all get in a check. Y'all keep it together. I got this. What y'all And about all that. I already know my position. I'm a leader whether I'm right here. I'm a leader or, 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 or whether I'm back here. I'm still a leader. And what makes you a great leader is that when it's time for you now to take a background seat, then you can allow this brother to do what he's got to do. I can push him. I'm behind him saying, keep going. I got you. I can see him. You good. Just keep there. Keep your eyes on the prize. Don't go to the left. Don't go to the right. Don't go. Just keep, just keep looking. Keep your mind stayed on him. Just keep walking. And then when it's, then he said, you know what? I'm done leading. Now he pulls out and comes back and it's Nick's turn to lead. And now he's sitting back. He done had his time to lead. And he said, go on, brother. Do your thing. Man, I know it's a little tough. Just keep it moving. Keep stepping. Keep marching. Don't stop. Don't let him stop you. Keep it moving. Amen. And we serve him. Love. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not mad, I'm not jealous. Because he may have been in the spotlight a lot longer than he was. I'm not mad at that. That doesn't bother me. Because we all are walking in the light, so I'm not worried about a light. Come on, now y'all can be seated. Give him a hand, praise. Like the Galatians, like the Judaizers, sitting back saying, Well, she didn't do it right. He didn't do it right. He didn't marry her first and all this. He didn't, you know, and they whatever, and they, you know, they was creeping and all that. They were slipping and dipping and all that. Back, he said, Look, you know what? The devil cannot create life. Amen. You can sit back and lay down and whatever and turn on, keep sweating all that. At the end of the day, I don't care how much he wise, he can't create life for you. Amen. Amen. So what I want y'all to understand is what freedom really looks like. Yes. What it looks like. Free to be you. Mm -hmm. The authentic you. The, un the, the unabridged, the unadulterated, the genuine you. Yes. And be comfortable and content in the skin that you're in. Whether you've been to the mat counter or you even went to clean cuts, be comfortable and content in the skin that you are in. And be free in that, that God made me fearfully and wonderfully made. Yeah. And if you are not happy or content with what he's given you, then go before him and talk to him about how it is you can get yourself to a place where you can really love yourself. If you say, God, you know, I just really want to shake a couple, he'll give you a workout regimen for you to work it out, for you to tilt up tight, whatever it is that you want to do, he'll make it happen for you. Yes. But you got to understand that he'll sit back and say, I want you to be in good health and prosper even as 
your soul prosper. So if you got to get your knees up in front of that thing in the morning and work it out and kind of duck them cinnamon rolls off or whatever and kind of cut those forks up and do what you got to do, baby. I ain't tripping because everybody got to lose something that they working on. Amen. Right? Amen. I believe in God to fill my son with fear. I don't know if it's going to happen, but I ain't going to stop petitioning them. It's more than road game. Don't laugh at me, man. I talk about you. Don't laugh at me, man. <laughs> Curtis, don't laugh at me, Curtis. <laughs> My wife thinks I don't look good with a bald head. I told her the devil is alive. That's Amen. my wife. Don't be able to be made. I love the head I got. You ain't got to like it. I like it. <laughs> but be free. Amen. You know, not being so rich and bound up. You're walking my walk. My walk ain't your walk. He said, everything is expedient, or everything is profitable, but everything is expedient. So just because it, it, it seems like it could be good for you because it looks good with somebody else, doesn't necessarily mean it is for you. Because you don't know what cross they're bearing to be able to not walk that walk, to manage that, that situation or issue. You don't know. Nobody here knows the size of one another's cross that we're bearing. You don't know. Because mine could be as big as this room, but I make it look as small as this little, little hand thing. But you don't know. It's about sitting back and saying, God, if I could help somebody through a word or through a song. Just say, I just want to serve you. That's all I was doing when I was in prison. Serve. I was crazy. You were the Crips one 